Hey again! Um, today we're going to continue reading The Westing Game by Ellen Raskin, starting with chapter 16. Um, if you recall when we read last time, um, another bomb went off, this time in Mr. Who's restaurant, um, and Sidel Pulaski was injured because she had just walked back into the kitchen um, right before it went off. But I think she just came out with a broken ankle, so she's fine. Um, and the police ruled that as a gas explosion, not a bomb. And they also said that the explosion in the coffee shop was a gas explosion as well, which makes the tenants a little bit suspicious because what's the likelihood of two gas explosions occurring within two days in the same building? Um, Amber Otis has now taken to shouting boom to anyone who walks by because he thinks it's funny to scare them because of the bombs. And the pairs have all continued working on their clues, but they haven't really made any progress. Um, except Judge Ford has found a couple more connections to the Westing family between um, the residents. So she found out that Flora Bombach made Violet Westing's um, wedding dress, and George Theodorakis, who is Theo's father, um, was actually the man that Violet truly wanted to marry. So she's starting to wonder if there are going to be any parallels between what happened back when Violet was getting married versus now. Um, so we will pick up with chapter 16, um, with Angela's wedding bridal shower. Chapter 16, The Third Bomb. Boom! Grace Wexler slammed the door on the delivery boy's silly face and returned to her party with a pink ribbon gift. The gossiping guests were sipping jasmine, jasmine tea from Westing Paper Party Cups, nibbling on tidbits from Westing Paper Party Plates, and w wiping their fingers on Westing Paper Party Napkins. Madame Who served in a tight-fitting silk gown slit high up her thigh, a costume as old-fashioned and impractical as bound feet. Women in China wore blouses and pants and jackets. That's what she would wear when she got home. Grace clapped her hands for attention. Girls, girls, it's time for the bride-to-be to open her presents. Angela, you sit here and everybody gather round. Angela did as her mother said. She lowered herself to a cushion on the floor, ringed by gift boxes and surrounded by vaguely, fa va vaguely familiar faces. She had not invited her few friends from college. They were bent on careers. This wasn't their thing. These were her mother's friends and the newly married daughters of her mother's friends, and Turtle, who was leaning against the wall, arms folded, smirking. Lucky Turtle, the neglected child. Read it out loud, dear, Grace ordered as Angela opened the card tied to the yellow ribbon box. To the bride-to-be in the kitchen stuck, an asparagus cooker and lots of luck. From Cookie Barf Springer. Thank you, Angela said, wondering which one was the Barf Springer. The next gift was an egg poacher. The box and, box and pink ribbons contained another asparagus cooker. I sure hope Dr. Deer likes asparagus, someone remarked. The giver said she could return it for something else, although two might come in handy. A doctor's wife has so much entertaining to do. Angela glanced at her watch and reached for the tall, thin carton wrapped in gold foil. Look how Angela's hands are shaking. She's as nervous as a groom. Giggles. Bride to be jitters. More giggles. Slowly, Angela unknotted the gold ribbon. Carefully, she unfolded the gold foil. How neatly she did everything. The perfect child. Not like Turtle, who ripped off wrappings impatient to see what was inside. Hurry up, Angela, you're such a poke, Turtle complained. Suddenly, there she was, kneeling down to peek under the lid. Get away, Angela cried, jerking the gift up and away from her sister as the lid blasted off with a shattering bang. Bang, bang, a rapid rat-a-tat-tat. -tat. Rockets shooting, fireballs bursting, comets shrieking, sparks sizzling, two dozen framed flower prints falling off the wall. Then it was over. Screams hushed to whimpers, and the trembling guests crawled out from under tables and peered out of closets. Is anyone hurt? Grace Wexler asked nervously. Other than being scared out of ten years of their lives, thank you, they were, they were fine. Where's Angela? Angela was still seated on the cushion in the middle of the floor. Fragments of the scorched box lay in her burned hands. Blood oozed from an angry gash on her cheek and trickled down her beautiful face. Heirs, beware, Sam Westing had warned. They should have listened. Now it was too late. The suspicious heirs gathered in the lobby around the police captain called in by Judge Ford. 
One of them was a murderer, they thought, and one of them was a bomber, and one of them was a thief. But which was which, and who was who? Or could it be one and the same? Some game, Mr. Gru Mr. Who grumbled, unwrapping a chocolate bar. One ulcer wasn't enough. Sam Westing had to give him three more. Some game. The last one alive wins. Now there's a likely suspect, Oder Samber thought. Who? The inventor. Who? The angry man. The madman. The last one alive wins, Flora Bombach repeated. Oh my, what a terrible thing to say. Can't trust that dressmaker, Mr. Who thought. How come she's grinning at a time like this? The captain offered no help at all. Neither the bomb squad nor the burglar detail has enough evidence to search the apartments, he explained. You call that justice? Sandy asked. Good nature Sandy couldn't be the one. He wasn't in the building when the first two bombs went off, or when the judge's watch was stolen, Jake, was Jake Wexler thought. On the other hand, he sure did hate Sam Westing. Yes, Mr. McSuthers, justice is exactly what I call it. Not her, not the judge, in spite of the clues, Chris thought, unless she's one of those Black Panthers in disguise. Those weren't gas explosions, those were bombs, right? Theo pressed the captain. A nice kid, that Theo. Doug, too, Flora Bombach thought. But how often had she seen the television interviews of next-door neighbors saying, Can't believe he killed 13 people. He was such a nice kid. Oh my, oh my, what's gotten into me, thinking such a thing? The captain would not call them bombs. More like childish pranks, he said. Childish pranks? That brat's capable of anything. Turtle stuck her tongue out at the sneering Doug who. Evil pranks of the devil, Crow muttered. Her blessed Angela was almost killed. Crow could be the one. Bring hellfire down on all of us, Theo whispered to Chris. But she wasn't in the building when the first two bombs went off. Yes, she, she was. No, she wasn't. The captain described the so-called bombs. Just a few fireworks triggered by a squat, by a squat striped candle, sorry. Just a few fireworks triggered by a squat striped candle set in a tall open jar. The ribbon probably hid the air holes in the box. No one would have been hurt if the young lady had not tilted the box toward herself. A time bomb, Grace Wexler said, glaring at the person who delivered the gifts. An unhappy woman, that self-appointed heiress, the judge thought, unfulfilled, possibly disturbed, capable of the burglaries, perhaps, but not the bombings. She wouldn't have hurt her own daughter, at least not Angela. Don't look at me like that, Otis Amber shouted at Miss, Mrs. Wexler. I don't own no striped candles, or no fireworks, neither. That idiot is the likeliest of all, Grace thought, but he wasn't around when the coffee shop blew up. Oh, God. The excitement was too much for Chris Theodorakis. That was one error no, no one suspected. And Angela, of course. No one, could exp no one could suspect her. Otis Amber was not even sure of that. Still waters run deep, he said. He, he, he. Turtle could not let him get away with that, even if it was true. Otis Amber limps, Chris noted the next day. Her family kept reassuring her. You're going to be fine, Angela. Just fine. The loud snore that erupted from the next hospital bed was Sadell Pulaski pretending to be asleep. I still don't remember, Angela mumbled. Her bandaged cheek made speaking difficult. Her face hurt. Her hands hurt. Hurt very much. Traumatic amnesia, Jake Wexler said. It happens after sudden accidents. Don't worry, Angie Pye. You're going to be fine. You're going to be fine, Angela. Just fine, Grace said despondently. I'll be back tomorrow. Come, Turtle. In a minute, Turtle waited for the door to close. She touched her sister's bandaged hands. Thanks. For what? Another snore from Sadell. Just thanks. The fireworks would have gone off in my face if you hadn't pulled the box towards you. Here, I brought your tapestry bag. I didn't look at your notes or clues. Honest. But she had removed the incriminating evidence. Turtle, tell me the truth. How bad is it? The doctor had to take some glass out of your hands, but no stitches. The burns will heal okay. In my face? Some scarring. Not bad, really, Angela. Besides, you always said being pretty wasn't important. It's who you really are that counts. Angela wondered about that. Maybe she was wrong. Maybe pretty was important. Maybe she was crazy. She must have been crazy. Don't worry, you'll still be pretty, Turtle said. But wow, that was sure a dumb thing to do. Sadell Pulaski's eyes popped open in surprise. Quickly, she squeezed them shut and uttered another loud snore. Well, what do you know? 
Her sweet, saintly partner was the bomber. Good for her. Chapter 17. Some Solutions Monday was a gray, rainy day. Depressing. So was the stock market, which fell another six points. Turtle was jittery. All the ears were jittery. The bomb squad was called in several times to examine suspicious parcels. One turned out to be a sealed vacuum cleaner bag full of dust that Crow had set behind the incinerator door. Another box was delivered to Mrs. Wexler. In it were bonbons, her favorite, and a note. Love and kisses, Jake. What do you mean, how come? Can't I send candy to my wife without getting the third degree? I thought you were looking on the thin side, okay? Grace made him eat the first piece. The next day, Grace received a larger box. In it, the bomb squad found one dozen long stone roses and a note. For no reason at all, just love, Jake. The bomb squad was called again when Turtle ran after her partner in the, through the lobby, shouting, Mrs. Bombach, Mrs. Bombach. Somebody thought she had shouted, Bomb, Bomb. A hollow wind wailed through damp, damp Tuesday. In the morning, the stock market rose three points. Bullish, said Florida Bombach. In the afternoon, the market dropped five points. Bearish, said Flora Bombach. Those were the only two trading terms she had learned. Madame Hu, a quicker student than the dressmaker, had learned more words. Partner, money, house, tree, road, pots, pans, okay, football, good, rain, spare ribs. Her teacher, Jake Wexler, visited her in the kitchen before he sat down to his daily lunch in the Chinese restaurant. Today, his wife and Jimmy Hu agreed to eat with their only customer on the promise that he would help them with their clues and not take a share of the inheritance if they won. Grace laid their five words on the table. These are clues? Jake looked down on purple waves for fruited sea. He switched to two squares of Westing super strength towels. Purple fruited makes more sense. How about grapes or plums? Grace was about to insist on purple waves, but plums... Plums reminded her of something. Plum, she said aloud. Plum, wasn't the lawyer's name Plum? You're right, Grace, Mr. Mr. Who said excitedly. You're absolutely right. He tore one of the clues in two. Fruit, Ed. Ed, purple fruit. Ed, plum. We got it, we got it, Grace cried, leaping up to embrace her partner. I never did trust lawyers, Mr. Who shouted gleefully. What about the other clues? Four sea waves. Jake asked, but the happy hugging and dancing celebrating pair did not hear him. Boom, said Madame Who, placing a plate of spare ribs on the table. That word she had learned from Otis Amber. Sandy was proud of the notebook he bought, with its glossy cover photograph of a bald eagle in flight. Sort of appropriate, he explained to the judge. Fits in with Uncle Sam and all that. In it, he painstakingly entered the information called from the reports and the, the private detective delivered each day to Judge Ford's office. Photo stats of birth certificates, death, death notices, marriage licenses, driver's licenses, vehicular accident reports, criminal records, hospital records, school records. To these, the doorman added the results of his own snooping. My investigator is having a difficult time getting into the not-so-public records of Westingtown, judge, the judge said. We'll have to put the Westings aside and begin with the heirs. Since we're feasting on chicken with water chestnuts, Sandy said, I'll start off with the Who's. Doug had delivered down. He read aloud from his entry. Who? James Shin Who. Born James Who in Chicago. Age 50. Added Shin to his name when he went into the restaurant business because it sounded more Chinese. First wife died of cancer five years ago. Married again last year. He has one son, Douglas. Sun Lin Who. Age 28. Born in China. Immigrated from Hong Kong two years ago. Gossip. James Hu married her for her 100-year-old sauce. Douglas Hu, called Doug. Age 18. High school track star. Is competing in Saturday's track meet against college milers. Westing Connection. Hu sued Sarah Westing over the invention of the disposable paper diaper. Case never came to court. Westing disappeared. Settled with the company last year for $25,000. Thinks he was cheated. Latest invention, paper intersoles. 
I can take some credit for those paper inner soles, Sandy bragged. My feet were killing me, standing at the door all day. So I said to Jimmy, Jimmy, if only somebody would invent a good inner sole that didn't take up so much room like those foam rubber things. And sure enough, he did it. They're great. I got a pair of nice shoes now. Want to see? No, thank you. The judge was eating. It was past midnight when Theo finished his homework in the dim light of the study lamp. The wind was still howling, and something, a word, a phrase, was still eluding him. He had been studying solutions in chemistry. Solutions, that was it. The solution is simple, the will said. He was sure of it. By changing four and the to the numbers four and three, Theo was able to rearrange the clues into a formula. Whether or not it was a chemical solution, let alone the Westing solution, was another matter. N, H, the parentheses, is, four, no, the, parentheses, two, equals NH four N O three. But four clue letters were left out. Is to Osit it so Otis. Otis he had it, a formula for an explosive in the name of the murderer. He had to tell Doug. Where g, g going? Shh Theo smoothed the blanket over his sleepy brother in the next bed, struggled into his bathrobe, and stumbled over the wheelchair as he tiptoed out of the room. The elevator made too much noise. Use the stairs. The cement was cold. He had forgotten his slippers. Two unmarked doors. Which one? Tap, tap, tap. A grunting voice, dragging footsteps. Please let it be Doug. Not Mr. Who or Judge Ford. It was Crow. Clutching a robe about her gaunt frame, her unknotted hair hanging limp, long and limp, she tried to focus her dull eyes on the shocked face of her visitor. Theo, Theo, the wind. I heard the wind. I knew you would come. Me? Grasping his hand, she pulled him into the maid's apartment between 4C and 4D and shut the door. We are sinners, yet shall we be saved. Let us pray for deliverance. Then you must go to your angel. Take her away. Theo found himself kneeling on the bare floor next to the praying crow. He must be dreaming. Amen. Chapter 18. The Trackers. It was Flora Bombach who braided Turtle's hair now, sometimes in three strands, sometimes four, sometimes twined with ribbons, while Turtle read the Wall Street Journal. Listen to this. The newly elected chairman of the board of Westing Paper Products Corporation, Julian R. Eastman, announced from London where he is conferring with the European management that earnings from all divisions are expected to double in the next quarter. That's nice, Flora Bombach said, not understanding a word of it. Turtle gave the order for the day. Listen carefully. As soon as you get to the broker's office, I want you to sell ammo, sell C, sell MT, and put all the money into WPP, okay? Oh my, that meant selling every stock mentioned in their clues and buying more shares of Westing Paper products at a loss of some thousands of dollars. Whatever you say, Alice, you're the smart one. Flora Bombach's hands were gentle. They never hurried or pulled a stray hair. Flora Bombach loved her, she could tell. I like when you call me Alice, Turtle said, but I better not call you Mrs. Bombach anymore because of the bomb scare. You know, calling her Florida would spoil, would spoil everything. Maybe I could call you Mrs. Baba? Why not just Baba? That's exactly what Turtle, Turtle Alice, wanted to hear. Was your daughter, Rosalie, very smart, Baba? My, no, you're the smartest child I've, I've ever met, a real businesswoman. Turtle, Turtle glowed behind the Wall Street Journal. I bet Rosalie baked bread and patched quilts and dumb stuff like that. The dressmaker's sure fingers fumble, fumbled over the red ribbons she was weaving into a four-strand braid. Rosalie was an exceptional child. The friendly, friendliest, lovingest. Turtle crumpled the newspaper. Let's go. I'm late for school, and you've, made, you've got that big trade to make. But I haven't finished tying the ribbons. Never mind. I like them hanging. Turtle felt like kicking somebody, anybody, good and hard. Sandy was not at the door when they left. He was in apartment 4D, neatly writing in his patriotic notebook information gathered on the next air. Bombach. Flora Bombach. Maiden name, Flora Miller. Age, 60. Dressmaker. Husband left her years ago. Sends no money. She had a retarded daughter, Rosalie, a mongoloid child. Sold bridal shop last year after Rosalie died of pneumonia, age 19. Spends most of her time at the stockbrokers. 
Westing Connection, made wedding gown for Violet Westing, which she never got to wear. Sandy turned to a fresh page, propped his feet on the judge's desk, and began to read the data supplied by the private investigator on Otis Amber. He laughed so hard he nearly fell out of the tilting chair. Haunted by last night's dream, Theo jogged behind his partner halfway to the, hi to the high school before he uttered a breathless stop. Doug Who stopped. Who lives in the apartment next to yours? Crow. Why? Nothing. How come he didn't know that? Because no one ever wonders where a cleaning woman lives, that's why. But he wasn't like that, was he? Still, it must have been a dream. In the dream, the nightmare, Crow had given him a letter, but the only thing he found in his bathroom pocket this morning was a Westing paper hanky. Hey, wait, Doug had started off again. I figured out our clues. Ammonium nitrate. It's used in fertilizers, explosives, and rocket propellants. I knew those clues were a pile of fertilizer, Doug replied, jogging easily. But only one thing mattered, Saturday's big track meet. If he won or came in fat came in a fast second, he'd have his pick of athletic scholarships. He didn't need the inheritance. Stand still and listen, Theo grabbed Doug by the shoulders and held him flat-footed to the ground. Like it or not, we're partners, and you've got to do your share. Sure, Doug replied. His father was angry, his partner was angry, and a bomber was blowing up sunset towers floor by floor. Some game. What do you want me to do? Follow Otis Amber. Head tilted back, Florida Flora Bombach squirted drops in her eyes, blinked, and stared again at the moving tape. Oh my, Westing paper products had jumped, had jumped four and a quarter, no, four and a half points. Her eyes must be blurry from the medicine. The dressmaker sat on the edge of her chair, biting her fingernails, waiting for WPP to cross the board again. There, WPP, $40. Oh my, oh my, this, poor, this morning she had paid $35 a share. There it goes again, WPP, $40 and a quarter. Oh my, oh my, oh my. After classes, instead of, instead of running around the indoor track, Doug Hu jogged out of the gym to the shopping center six blocks away. There was Otis Amber, placing two cake bombs in the compartment, sorry, placing two cake boxes in the compartment of his bike. He picked up a package from the butcher shop and pedaled off, unaware of the, sweet, the sweat-suited figure trotting half a block behind him, and went into Sunset Towers to make his deliveries. Hi, Doug. Gonna run the mile under four minutes on Saturday? The doorman asked. Sure hope so. Do me a favor, Sandy. Give a loud whistle when Otis Ambers comes out. Okay? Chiptooth Sandy gave such a loud whistle that Otis Amber would have been deafened if the flaps on his aviator helmet had not been snug against his ears. Leaving his bicycle in the parking lot, Otis Amber boarded a bus. Doug ran the five uphill miles to a house with the placard, E.J. Plum, attorney. He ran another three uphill miles after the bus that took the delivery boy to the hospital entrance. Doug sank down in a waiting room chair, wiped his face on his sweatshirt, and picked up a magazine. Fascinated by the centerfold picture, he almost missed Otis Amber, who, sh who dashed out of the hospital as though fleeing for his life. Hiding behind parked cars, Doug followed the delivery boy to another bus, ran four steep miles to a stockbroker's office. How is it that all roads go uphill? From the broker to the high school, from the high school, downhill at last, back to Sunset Towers. The exhausted track star leaned against the side of the building, thankful he was not a long-distance runner. I gotcha, Otis Amber poked a skinny finger into Doug's ribs. He, 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 he cackled, standing, handing the startled runner a letter. It's from that lawyer, lawyer Plum. Says all the heirs got to be at the Westing House this Saturday night. Sign here. With his last ounce of energy, he wrote Doug Who Myler on their seat and then slid down to the wall, just slid down the wall to a weary squat. Some Myler. His feet were blistered. His muscles sore. He could barely breathe. He might never run another step in his life. On receiving the notice of the Westing House meeting, Judge Ford canceled her remaining appointments and hurried home. Time was running out. Sandy read to her from his notebook. Amber. Otis Joseph Amber. Age 62. Delivery boy. Fourth grade dropout. IQ 50. Lives in the basement of Gro Green's Grocery. A bachelor. No living relatives. Westing Connection. Delivered letters from E.J. Plum, attorney, both times.
I would have guessed Otis had an IQ of minus ten, Sandy said with a smile. Go on to the next heir, the judge replied. Deer. D. Denton Deer. Age 25. Graduate of UW Medical School. First year intern, plastic surgery. Parents live in Racine, not heirs. Western Connection. Engaged to Angela Wexler, C. Wexler's who looks like Sam Westing's daughter, Violet, who is also engaged to be married, but to a politician, not an intern. That's awful complicated, I know, the doorman apologized, but it's the best I could do. Pulaski. Sadell Pulaski. Age 50. Education, high school, one-year secretarial school. Secretary to the president of Schultz Sausages. It's taking her first vacation in 25 years. Six months saved up time. Lived with widowed mother and two aunts until she moved to Sunset Towers. Walked with a crutch even before she broke her ankle in the second bombing. Now needs two crutches. She paints them. Weston Connection? Question mark. We don't have any medical reports on her muscular ailment, Sandy reported. The nurse at Schultz Sausages says she was in perfect health when she left on vacation. Strange, the judge remarked. A suspicious malady, no apparent in the Westing effect. No apparent Westing connection. Somehow, Sidel Pulaski did not seem to fit in. Sidel Pulaski clasped the translated notes to her bosom. My little secret mustn't peek, she said coyly, but the doctors have come to see Angela. The plastic surgeon loosened, loosed the tape from her cheek and peered under the gauze. One graft should do it, but we, had, we can't operate until the tissue heals, he said to the intern, then spoke to the patient. Call my secretary for an appointment in two months. He strode out of the room, leaving Denton Deer to replace the bandage. I don't want plastic surgery, Angela mumbled. It still hurt to talk. Nothing to be frightened of. He's the best when it comes to facial repairs. That's why I brought him in. We'll have to postpone the wedding. We can have a small informal wedding. Mother wouldn't like that. How about you, Angela? What do you want? He knew her unspoken answer was, I don't know. The door flew open and slammed against the adjacent wall. Where do you think you're going? Denton pulled Turtle to a halt by one of the streaming ribbons twisted in her head. The sign says no visitors. I'm not a visitor. I'm a sister. Get, and get your germy hands off my hair. Denton Deer hurried to seek, the first, to seek first aid for his bleeding shin and sent the biggest male nurse on the floor to take care of Turtle, the same male nurse who chased Otis Amber out of the hospital for sneaking up on a nurse's aide carrying a specimen tray and shouting, Boom! Turtle had one had time for one question. Angela, what did you sign on the receipt this time after position? Person. I chained my name to victim, Sidel said. Turtle paid no attention to the victim. She was more interested in the two men entering the room. The burly male nurse and that creep of a lawyer, Plum. I gotta go. Don't say anything to anybody about anything, Angela. No matter what happens. Not even to a lawyer. You know nothing, you hear? Nothing. She skirted Ed Plum, ducked under the outstretched hairy hands of the male nurse, slid down the hall, scampered up, down the stairs, and out of the hospital. Hi, how are you? Ed Plum smiled at Angela, ignoring the, pa the patient in the other bed. He didn't recognize Miss Pulowski without her painted crutch. I'm sorry to hear about your accident. Otis Amber told me about it. Just thought I'd drop in for a chat. The young lawyer, who had admired the pretty heiress from the minute he first laid eyes on her, did not have a chance to chat. Grace Wexler entered the room, saw the answer to the clues, Ed Purplefruit, the murderer, standing over her daughter, and uttered a blood-curdling shriek. Three visitors in one day. The first was Otis Amber with a letter and another receipt to sign. Chris had pretended to be scared by the boom, but he wasn't really. He had twitched because he was excited about going to the Westinghouse again, even if he hadn't figured out the clues. Then Flora Bombach came to see him. He wasn't nervous at all with that nice lady. She smiles that funny smile because she's sad inside. She once had a daughter named Rosalie. She told him how Rosalie would sit in the shop and say hello to the customers and how she would feel the fabrics. Mrs. Bombach made wedding dresses, which are mostly white, so, he bought, so she bought samples of materials with bright colors and patterns because Rosalie loved colors best. Rosalie had 573 different swatches in her collection before she died. Mrs. Bombach said her daughter might have been an artist if things had turned out differently. What would I have been if things had turned out differently, he thought. The third visitor entered. Limping. His partner was limping. 
Too much excitement. His stupid body was jerking all over the place. Denton Deer sat down next to the wheelchair. Take it easy, Chris. Calm down, kid. I'm not the creature from the Black Lagoon, you know. His partner, a doctor, watched horror movies on television, too. Slowly, arms untangled, legs unsnarled. Slowly, Chris stuttered out his news. Flora Bombach felt so guilty about seeing their drop clue that she told him one of, their, one of her clues. Mountain. But we mustn't tell Turtle. Don't worry, the intern said, displaying a bruised shin. Chris laughed, then stopped. I s s sorry. Mountain. Hmm. Denton Deer thought about the new clue. If a treasure is hidden in a grain shed on a mountain plain, I sure don't have time to look for it. Do you? N no, no, no. Let's forget the clues. I have something more important to tell you. Don't get excited, okay? Chris nodded. His partner was going to ask for the money. Denton Deer stood. I'll get your toothbrush and pajamas. Then we'll go to the hospital. Don't get excited. Chris got excited. How could he explain that he wanted from... How could he explain that what he wanted from his partner was companionship, not more probing, pricking do doctors with their bad news that made his mother cry? Listen, Chris, can you hear me? Just overnight, I found a neurologist, a nerve doctor, who works on problems like yours. Operation? No operation. Did you hear me, Chris? No operation. The doctor thinks the new medicine may help, but he has to examine you, make some tests. I have your parents' permission, but no one will touch you unless we talk it over first, you and me, together. I promise. Chris grimaced, trying to smile. His partner said talk it over, the two of them, together. They were really partners now. You c can have m money. What? Oh, the money. Later. Here, take. let me take those. You won't need them in the hospital. Chris clung to his binoculars. Well, I guess you do need them. Ready? Here we go. All of a sudden, he was leaving Sunset Towers, pushed by his limping partner. Maybe Dr. Deer is not who and what he says he is. Maybe he is being kidnapped for ransom. Maybe he's being held hostage. Oh boy, he hasn't had so much fun in years. That's the end of chapter 18. We will continue in the next video with chapter 19.